Hi, everybody. I really am really excited about today. I want to introduce to you a very dear friend of mine who started off as my publisher, but then quickly became my very, very special friend, Scott Alexander King. Throughout the In Search Of process, we've actually been interviewing some really amazing people with some tough stories. And this one is equally as eye-opening because while many people think that the women are often the abused, men very much are not seen as the abused. And this is one story which will captivate you and show you how courage can really take you on a path to live your wildest dreams. So Scott, thank you so much for being part of this. <laughs> I feel very honored. I'm very, 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 feel very, very honored. So thank you very much. Well, you've got a story and I remember you and I have had many conversations, late night conversations yeah. um, with your wife and where you have mentioned your childhood, your upbringing, and when they see someone on stage such as you and you know you're very very prominent in Australia through animal dreaming and the work that you do no one realizes the story that you have and as a man you you well I'll tell you you tell the story I mean because I, I I don't have words for it it's not my story to tell yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I understand that. I appreciate you saying that because it is, even for me, that my story is going to be different to everyone else's. Everyone's mm -hmm. story is unique and everyone's experiences of, you know, life um, are different. So I've just, because I've experienced certain things doesn't mean to say I still understand what other guys have gone through in my position. But yes, I had a very, um, very unconventional, I guess you'll say childhood. It was very challenging. It was very... Um, I was very uncertain most of the time. My mother remarried, um, well, she separated from my biological father and um, remarried a man who had, unbeknownst to me, um, already had spent time in um, prison for pedophilia. So this is something that back in the 70s, which is mm -hmm. when he was arrested and put in jail for the crimes that he was accused of, um, back then a lot of this stuff was swept under the mat. It wasn't spoken about. It wasn't something that people wanted to hear about. It just was something that people would prefer to pretend never happened. So he, um, it was a very short, um, um, what's the word when you're leading into a new relationship, that, that, that honeymoon period. Honeymoon was very, period, very, yeah. It was very short for my mother and stepfather because they married very, very quickly because it was pretty clear to me now, looking back, that he um, wasn't really interested in her or the family life. It was more me because I was the right age and all those sorts of things. So, so he, they got married and he had, he'd suffered a stroke. He's passed away now, by the way. So that was a very happy day for me when that happened. I know it sounds <laughs> I was terrible, say but it was such a, yeah, it was a, it was a weight off my shoulders, Lisa. It was like, he can't do this to anyone else now, you know? And, and, and I'm sure many people just talking about this, I'm sure many people who have encountered abusers, who have encountered situations when that person dies or when that person maybe gets put inside or whatever happens, there is a relief. And, I want to say that sometimes it's okay to feel that relief. Well, you agree? I did. Yes, definitely. It's and, and to celebrate it in a bizarre way, not celebrate it with a party, but celebrate it within yourself that I survived this and now mm. no one can be hurt by this person again. But I'll tell you, there was also quite a large amount of grief because I never got closure. I never got the explanation as to what, why he thought this was appropriate. Yeah. I never got the reason for why me, like why did he pick me? So, and I never, and I never got the all evasive apology. You know, I never got yeah. that. And it's very tricky to, even like thinking back now, I feel a little bit robbed because of that, but I feel free because now I know I can live my life without worry of, it happening to my children, yeah. you know, because I, 
when we were approaching the age that I was, when my kids were approaching that same age, that's when I made the decision to pull away. I, I said, I can't be doing this anymore. I can't. And my mother says she didn't know, but it was pretty, she would have had to have been, <laughs> she would have to have been bound and gagged 24 hours a day, seven days a week to not have noticed that something was a little dodgy so, in our so, family. So. so what was, um, you know, I mean, you you told me a story how, you know, you were never alone in bed, uh, if no. I can put it that way. Yeah. So, so not without obviously a detail, but just give us I'll some tell you, I'll tell you, oh, I'm happy to share the story. Yeah, give us some idea. He, because he, he'd had a stroke. So he used to get these really bad headaches and stuff all the time. And very soon after marrying my mother, he told her that he really needed a good night's sleep. Mm. So he can't be going on where he can't sleep because she was a snorer and he, you know, yeah. so it was all perfect, perfect scenario. So he came up with this and we were living with his parents at the time. How's that? Like all this was happening with other people in the house. So it was a um, three bedroom house. And so my parents lived in what were in one room and my sister and I, cause we were, you know, cause I was only six or seven at the time, quite small. So we were sharing the other room and he suggested that in order for him to get a good night's sleep, it might be better if she moved into the room with my sister and I moved into the room with him. And that was my life for the next 17 years, every so night several times during the day, like it was just intense. It never eased up. And you start to believe that it's normal, Lisa. You start to mm -hmm. feel that this is normal because no one's saying anything. No one's doing anything. No one's checking. And the authorities didn't even check when they when he married my mother. There was no one who came around to check, knowing that he'd been in prison for this. There was no protection. There was no checking in. There was no, are you okay? Do you feel safe? because she prayed to God and met him. So she assumed that God had sent him. And I tried to speak to her about it, Lisa. I said, you know, like, this isn't, what if, because that's uh, how things happen. Like, you'll understand being in the work you do, the synchronicities and how things just oh, happen. Yeah. So my sister was a medical receptionist when, she, when we got older. She, she left school early because it just wasn't for her. And went into the workforce and one of her first jobs was a medical receptionist. So here she is in our family doctor's surgery and my stepbrother had come in for an appointment and as she's lifting his file down off the shelf, because, you know, in the old days of paper, paper yeah. files. Those long files, this, yeah. That's right. And this is what I'm, I know that there was something else at work here that I know that this wasn't, this was all meant to come out at the time. You know, as she's lifting the file down, this piece of paper slipped out of the file, like randomly this one, and it landed on her desk. And now, because it was our stepbrother, she just looked at it. Like if it was a other other client or another patient, she wouldn't have, she would have slipped yeah. it back in because it's confident. And it very clearly said, he was talking about the fact that his, his father had been in prison and all this was, um, you know, and, and what he was in there for. So I... And she came home and um and and put the piece of paper like we're having dinner, and she puts this piece of paper on the kitchen table in front of everyone. She didn't even tell me she was going to do it, and she said, "Can you explain this?" And he was like, "Well," and my wow. mother was like, "Oh, oh." My mother was like, "Oh, oh, oh." Anyway, they managed to explain it away, and my mother was happy with that explanation. And what was on so that even piece of paper? that he'd been in prison for pedophilia, that he was, um, it was a letter from my stepbrother to his psychologist, basically. Wow. And of course the doctor had been given a copy of it. So it was a letter outlining his childhood, outlining the stories he'd heard, outlining the knowing that his mother, his father had been away for a while and um, the reasons for that and who the boy was and how all this, the, the whole story was there. And he said, yes, that did happen, but I was accused wrongly the boy made up stories um I was innocent and my mother said and I believe him and I said well later on because I couldn't talk in front of him I said to her later what if he's not innocent 
And she said, how can you say that? He's a good man. God sent him to me. And I just knew at that point, I had no, there was no one there that I could turn to. There was no one that I could say, is this normal? There was no one. So, and I, and, and it really played out in my personal life because I didn't know how to have a girlfriend. I yeah. didn't know, I didn't feel comfortable in the gym, you know, getting changed for gym class. I didn't feel comfortable having showers after gym class. So I would just leave. I wouldn't go to gym class. And there were so many times in my life that I could feel this panic rise. And all because of someone's greed and need and want. And it's hard to explain the impact of all that, but it's just, it's never left me. So let's, you know, you found absolute happiness, you know, with oh, your yes. wife of 20 odd years. Um, yes. But how has the abuse of the stepfather changed your life? If you look back at your, your life, and you obviously have amazing children. If you look back at your children's life to your life, and in comparison, what... Well what hmm. what do you see i mean what 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 do you see obviously you're an amazing father i know that i'm very protective hmm. but sometimes lisa that's not being powerfully and ferociously hmm. protective isn't necessarily um good for the kids right yeah. because they don't get the, <clears throat> I'm, i've i know in my heart i've done a lot of preventing i've prevented them from experiencing a lot of things that other people have to go through to, in order to learn about life yeah. i haven't wrapped them in cotton wool but i've certainly because i can tell you now i can spot a predator at 40 paces wow. no one can get past i can tell mm -hmm. when someone's not right and also like yourself i have the ability to see and i think and i can chat about that after but i, I really believe that came about because of necessity it was a survival technique yeah and so when I look at people now I can tell when they're dodgy I can tell straight away so I don't want so if I can see something happening I'll prevent I'll, I'll, I'll tell my kids I'll prevent mm. them from having to go through even helpful <laughs> helpful things I'll you know so so it was very confusing earlier on because I didn't know how to be a dad yeah I didn't know what a dad's role was because my role model had been so tainted I hadn't does that make sense I hadn't yeah so I hadn't really ever had that father role model so then and because um I also didn't have a role model of what how a family should be operating mm. I didn't have that a healthy family oh <clears throat> well this is the thing because everyone else looking into our life from the outside looking in our life was perfect mm. We had everything that opened and shut. We had, you know, if there was a new, like when video, when video players first came out, we got one. Like we were one of the first ones in our street to have one. All those sorts of things because it was a very important for us to look wholesome and successful. But what was happening on the inside, no one ever got to see. I was never allowed to have friends over. I was right. never allowed to go to friends' houses in case I spoke about things I shouldn't speak about or observed things that were like, that's not how we live. So growing up and becoming a dad and becoming a husband were very, very confusing times for me because I did not, I, I did not, I knew what was right and wrong, don't get me wrong, but what's appropriate within that and what's not appropriate. I, I was very, it was all very clouded and very confused. Your boundaries were clouded, yeah. So I was terrified, Lisa, of letting my kids play in the front yard. Right. And we lived on a rural property out in the bush. There was no one passing by. And if they were going to come through, they probably would have come through the back paddock anyway, not through the front door. So you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was all rather skewed. I was very, even to this day, um, I'm very anxious about my kids not being in eye shot of myself. I'm getting better. <laughs> but it's, but you know, like when they, when my kids decided they want to catch the bus to school, like you've got no idea how, um unsure of that I was but I let them do it and it got better and easier because I would just pump them for questions I would just ask them like what happened oh, to bus driver like <laughs> 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 you know what I mean just, oh yeah you don't know you don't know who you can trust and you don't know because they don't look like bad people most of them they're just like regular folk 
and they and they're very smoothy like they're very clever at the way they communicate so th they make you feel like they're your friend and yeah definitely very hard it's very confusing so it's, it was a very challenging time it's very it's very apparent in today's society how there's a lot of people we talk about grooming children we talk about grooming yes with trafficking of kids and everything yes. else and it doesn't just happen with young girls it happens with boys too yes. um but what was the point of courage for you at the well, point where you went i can't do this anymore and i need a voice well i found i found some courage <laughs> you're gonna make me cry Lisa. <laughs> the day the day trudy said yes that she would marry me that gave me, I had to, I think, okay, well, now I have to figure this out. I have to, but I never spoke about it. Mm. I didn't, she didn't know about my childhood. I was so ashamed. I was so anxious. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I, I felt ashamed. So when um, she said, yes, I'll marry you, I thought, I've got, this is, this is a crucial time. And I, mm. I endeavoured to become braver and stronger and more confident but i'll tell you it wasn't really until um i came home from work and i was a school teacher at the time believe it or not because i wanted to save kids i wanted to make yeah. sure that they, their future was safe so i thought what better way to do that than become a teacher and i put everything all my heart and soul into that job and i came home from school one day and she said to me i don't know how to tell you this but you're going to be a dad and wow. that's that point that point at that point i realized i had someone else that i had to protect i had to be there for so all thought because i used to ponder every now i wasn't suicidal but i would often ponder if the world would be better off without me in it and mm. and i was so afraid that i was lying to trudy and that what if she was angry with me if she ever found out what if she was disgusted what if this, and so I'd been wasting her life when she could be with someone decent. <laughs> yeah. So when she said I was going to be a dad, I thought, fuck, this is it now. This is really serious. Still, I didn't speak about it until she was about um, six or seven. Right. So you can imagine I was holding all this in and I was still seeing my parents and stuff. And this, this is your time. daughter who was six and seven. Yeah, six or seven. Yes. And I didn't because I knew that she was safe because she was a girl. Yeah. But how can you be sure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? If there's mm -hmm. if if you're someone who likes um say strawberry shortcake and there's only fruit cake in the fridge you'll still might try the fruitcake. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Good way of putting it. Yeah, I agree. Well, I didn't know what was possible and what wasn't. So, and I was getting more and more anxious knowing that he was interested in a certain age group. And, mm. and I couldn't just say, so I can't bring my kids around anymore because they'd want to know why and then I'd have to talk about it. This friend of mine visiting us at the time, out of the blue, just said, can you go get your animal cards, please? And I was using the, um, I didn't have, I wasn't an author then. So these were a deck of cards yeah. that I was using myself. And I, and they were very precious to me. So I knew that she was, she was also the woman who trained me in all the earth medicine stuff that I do. She was right. my teacher. Yeah. So I loved and trusted her very, very much. She said, go and get your cards. I want to do you a reading. And I was like, oh, I just knew. And she pulls out these cards, Lisa, and she had no idea because I was a really good secret keeper. Yeah. And do you know what I mean? And yeah. she pulled out the cards and she said to me, um, so and the, the dog animal cards, obviously, and they had nothing to do with what she was talking about. She was channeling. Right. I think she was channeling my grandfather. Right. And she said, you know, you know, Trudy loves you very much. And I said, mm hmm and she said, you know, that, um, you know, if, if, if you had something to tell her, um, she'd be okay to hear that. And I was like, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And she said, so what if, for example, you were molested or abused as a child? Like it just, she just said, I was like, what? <laughs> and I said, well, she'd like, 
have got and after the reading she said so what what how was that and i was like well i do have something i want to tell you and i had this really good friend at the time right. and i spent a lot of time with him and so she thought i was going to say <laughs> that i was going to be running away with him right, right. <laughs> I don't know what she thought that was the that was that would be the worst case scenario because her childhood and mine were polar opposites she had a mum who would she was ferocious oh, yeah. she was ferociously protected she would have like she was she had a good life you've, yeah. you've met Trude's yeah. mum <laughs> I have I have yes um anyway so in the reading she says you know all this information and I said oh Trude I do have something to tell you so I said it's and I start and I said, so I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you my story, but I want you to know that I love you very much. And if you choose to leave me, it's okay. Because <laughs> I felt so ashamed. I just could not believe it. That this was, God, my worst nightmare. <laughs> that explains so much. She said, I understand now. She didn't understand what I'd been through because she didn't know anyone who'd gone through what I went through. She'd never met anyone who had experienced what I'd experienced to the level that I'd been experiencing it. The regularity and you know how often it happened and how it, she said it, but it just shaped, it just explains so much as to who and why you are the person you are. You know, like why you are not in a damaged way because it's hard to explain. I never once fell into victim mode. I never once. Um, I, I was confused and angry and very overwhelmed, but I was never, I never felt sorry for myself. I did, I knew because my grandfather was visiting me in my dreams and things a lot. And I would see him, even though he'd, been, he'd passed away a long time before. So I knew that he was watching over me. I knew that. Right. Yeah. And he'd once said to me in a dream sort of state that it would be okay. So I, I believed him. But I honestly thought she would leave me. I honestly thought she'd pack my kids up and and to the point where, I know this sounds really weird, I'd prepared for this day because the house was in her name. Um, because I was never gonna, I was like <laughs> she's my wife, she's my they're my kids. Like they've got it, they will I'll be the one that moves out and they yeah. can keep the house. I, I never I'd prepared for it. And even now the house is in Trude's name because that's the way it is. You yeah, know, like, exactly. I want, I want her to have that forever security, you know. Yeah. Anyway, it's it, it that's the day. That that is the day that I grew balls. <laughs> and I became so you found courageous. courage. I did. I found courage and I believe and because she believed in me and she said she loved me. And I thought, okay, now I've got to. Here's my chance. Here's to make all this mean something. I, mm. I, I, it all happened for a reason. And I wanted to, I went on a mission to find out what that reason was. I, if spirit, God, whoever thought that I was strong enough to experience this, I wanted to know what the payout was. I wanted yeah. to know yeah. what, what, what it was all for, you know, yeah. so and that's that's the day that I realized this is really really important and I, and I want to also say it's very very strange that I would feel this way I guess looking from the outside in but I'm actually oh, it's hard to explain now um I'm not grateful but um oh, yes I would change a lot of things about yes. my past but I wouldn't change the lessons that I got out of it I think yeah. it's really shaped me it's made me a Oh gosh, it's made me the person I am. And whether that's a good person or a better person, I don't know. But I can tell you now I am driven to make things right for people. Like I just want to help people. I want to not keep people safe and protected, but loyalty and all those sorts of things are so important to me because mm. it's about um, community for me. And it's about family and it's about yeah. making a safe place for others who might not feel that way. So yeah, that's. And that's why the animals, I think, are so important to me because they, they never turn their back on me. They never, no. right through this whole thing, they were always there, always as a constant. And and that was your uh, way of uh, escaping, yeah. wasn't it? That was it your was. way of 
find in the animals and that's now how you do your readings you connect with the yeah. animals you can see a person you look at person see the animals around them that's how you do your readings right. but one thing yeah. that's that fascinates me oh it's not fascinating but I you know because I do a lot of this is the fact that someone who has been through the trauma that you have someone yeah. who has learned to hold the secret who has learned to hold things in the one thing that you know, and Trudy and I, we're your yeah. greatest cheerleaders. Yeah. But you, you know, you're obviously emotional. <laughs> you, truly are. Yeah. you are emotional. But a lot of people would have struggled to find that emotion, to get to that emotion, to be in that vulnerable space. Yeah. And now you're very open about that. You know, you're very I, I was, open. I was I spent many, many years, mm -hmm. Lisa, holding it in. Mm -hmm. I, I I was very um to be honest, I don't really remember that a lot of my those early years after I spoke about it. I don't really remember it clearly because yeah. I think I was trying to stay strong and I think I was in this weird fog. Um, and then after that day, though, where I spoke about it and I started to trust that it was okay to be um, vulnerable yeah. and to share how I feel so now um, I'll, I'm very vocal when it comes to explaining oh, yeah. how I feel about something but I'm also um, I'm also I, I probe other people too to get them to open up as well because I know the pain I want them to feel that they have a safe place that it's okay to talk because and that's why I get up on stage now in front of you know big crowds and I talk about not like I've done with you but I do talk about my childhood because I want people to know that it's okay to speak up it's yeah. okay to feel emotions it's okay to shed a tear even if you are a guy <laughs> you know? yeah. because it's not something that a lot of men particularly feel safe doing mm. because they feel like it's a sign of weakness or it's a sign of um you know um as if yeah it's a sign of weakness I don't know what else they could think it would be but for me it's actually a sign of strength I agree. If you can show your emotions, I believe that you're fast, you know, you're working toward becoming a whole person. And people can't comprehend that when I tear up, it's often because I'm grateful or there's beauty or, like, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, not so I can share my story, but I know people are going to listen to this and I know mm -hmm. people are going to find healing in these words. So I'm grateful for that. So yeah, it's hard to explain, but my no, tears, I, they do, they do, do flow quite cr freely. I do understand. <laughs> I Listen, tell people I've got leafy eye syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> one of the hardest things to do is to move through and uh, whether the word is forgive, whether the word is forget, whether the word is to move on, whatever it is for a person and yours will be different for someone else's. But one of the hardest parts is to move through the situation yes. without yes. an apology. Whether it is a betrayal, whether it's abuse, whether it is deceit, whatever it is, is to move through without the apology. What There's many people out there that have to do that. What yes. would you say to somebody who has to do that where they're not going to see that person again, or they may not have the opportunity of speaking face to face. What would you say to somebody to help them move through it? I always say it's a dance to dance through this where you're never going to get the apology that you want. I think you have to, first of all, Lisa, um, hearing it from that person might not be the apology that you're actually needing. I had to apologize to myself and I had to accept that apology myself because I could have spoken up any time. I could have gone to the police, but for me, I was told from an early age that if I was caught out, I'd go to jail. So as a little kid, you know, you told all these things, right? So. Of I had to apologize. I had to find peace in myself that I was so, I was afraid and all those sorts of things, but I was also gullible yeah. <laughs> because and I believed. Innocent. Yes, and yes. So, 
So I had to apologize. I had to accept my own apology first. And then it's sort of weird. After I did that, once I realized that, like I had nothing to apologize for, don't get me wrong. I, to this day, I know in my heart, I had nothing to apologize for, but you know, I felt ashamed of myself and I felt that I wasn't a, a real boy or I wasn't a real man. I wasn't a real human. I was this, anyway, once I accepted my own apology, it didn't, the need for his didn't really, it's hard to explain. No, I, still, I understand. I it, but it's not, it wasn't as pressing. Yeah. But also my wife, bless her, said to me one day, why are you so cross with him? but you're okay with your mum. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, whether it is an imbalance in the brain or not, I'm not sure. I don't know what it is that makes a man want to molest a small child yeah. or a woman, by the way, yeah. pedophiles are both men and women. They can be both or either, you know, so it's, she says, so I realized, oh my God, what, how, how does she seem to get off? You know, what, the, why shouldn't she be held accountable to some level? Because she was the one who agreed to me going in there in the first place and spending the next 17 years of my life. Yeah, definitely. Because even as a young, I was 20, I was in, in my very, very, like not even 20 yet, I don't feel like early, my early, and it was still happening. Like I was, wow. so this was 17 years of my life. Mm. Anyway, so um, yeah, by the time, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, that's, that's where the apology, that's, so I, I approached her and she apologised because she says right. she didn't know. But then the, next, the very next day she retracted the apology. So it right. comes down to, again, really comes down to finding the peace within yourself to know that you are a good person that you didn't deserve any of this, that you wouldn't do that to anyone else. And that's the, that's the, the realization that comes with it. Like you become super aware and super sensitive and to predators. So that is, I guess that's a superpower I have now, but it is. Um, yeah. But it's um, the apology. It's not going to come from anyone else because often they'll apologize, but they, they don't even know what they're apologizing for Correct. because to them it's normal yeah. and it's natural and they would, They'll apologize to you, but then they'll turn around, they'll do it again. So it's not even a genuine, they, they don't, I'm not making excuses because I would, I want to know that. I want to know why that is myself, but the apology, Lisa, has to come, you find it within yourself and you find that peace within yourself. And every day when you step out into the world and you meet people and they love you for who you are, even though they know the story, that's where the healing comes in. And that's when you realize this is actually okay. And this is okay. This is okay. You just, you know, yeah, this is safe. Okay. I'm safe. I'm okay. This is great. You know? Yeah. yeah good. So, yeah. you know, there's probably people who are listening to you, your story and it's, you know, it was, a, it's a very powerful one, but um, my thing is at four o'clock in the morning, it's always our yes. darkest hour. It's when we wake up not knowing what to do, or we've been, awake all night wondering or you know our brain is continually turning and at between four four and two uh, between two and four o'clock in the morning though those are the hardest times of the night where we don't have someone to turn to where we're continually churning things what would you what advice would you give to somebody who maybe have been in your situation been been abused been in a very difficult situation where they can't tell someone that they are supposedly trust like their mom, what is the advice that you would give to them at four o'clock in the morning to help them through that dark time? Oh. Well, as you know, you can try ringing friends. They're going to be asleep. You can try ringing a counselor. They're not going to be in the office. So the, the need to obviously vent or talk or ask questions is going to be, that's, that's what used to keep me awake. So I don't know if this is going to work for everyone, but I would chat to my, my inner self, mm -hmm. that damaged boy, I would chat to him and I would ask, because he was stronger than I was. <laughs> you know, that, that inner self, that little inner child, he, he is still to this day is stronger than I am. 
So I would ask him, I would ask him, I'd chat to him and about, you know, what's your plans? You know, like, how, how do you suggest I get through this? What's the best way to move forward? Or I would chat to my ancestors, my grandfather, who I know it sounds a bit odd to people, but I used, I used to have, have this black cat that followed me everywhere I went. I would be in the bathroom when I was having a shower. I'd be on the end of my bed. I could feel it, you know, pouring, how they pour mm. at the, And I'd see it at school. I'd see it everywhere. And I, when I was about 15, I was standing in, in, in my room and walking up the hallway was his cat. And I honestly thought we had a cat, Lisa. Right? <laughs> and, if I, I, and I would say to the parents, you know, like, the cat's here again. And they'd say, is it? Like, if your kid said to you, Lisa, there's a cat in the lounge room, you'd say, show me, right? Show me. We don't have a cat. We don't have a cat. Show me the cat. They never did. So I, I, it was very weird. Like, anyway, this cat walking up the hallway and next minute it's standing on its back legs and next minute it's my freaking grandfather for yeah. a very brief moment and I would chat to him because I realised he was with me right. and he was my mother's father and he was not impressed. He was very annoyed with her yeah. <laughs> for being so ne negligent. She was yeah. very negligent. Yeah. Like she was, I'm sure she loved me. Um, well, she told herself that she loved me, but his money and the security he gave her was of greater value to her <laughs> than yeah. my well-being. So I would chat, and, that, and I would suggest to anyone, you you don't have to know who you're talking to. Just shut your, shut your eyes, take a deep breath, and just ask those questions. Vent, get angry. If you have to, if you're alone, yell and scream if you have to. Just get it off your chest. It, it's the perfect time because no one's going to know. <laughs> but the spirits are awake at that time. Yeah. They yeah. are. And they will hear you and they will make, they'll put things right because it's not the words they're going to respond to. It's the, it's the desperation. It's the angst. It's the confusion. The words don't really matter. It's the, it's the acknowledgement of those feelings and the fear and the worry and the shame. And chat to yourself about all that chat to your, your inner self, chat to them. And it, I can't explain it, but you do, it does make a difference because yeah. when you believe that no one's going to believe you, and if they do believe they're going to lock you up, <laughs> um, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's, who else, do you, who else is there except yeah. yourself? Because you've got to remember we've got, we're grown up now, you and I grown up, yeah. but we're still largely driven by this little voice that spoke when we were first born and we are still that person. I'm still a kid. You know, I'm still a kid. I say I'm still, a, I'm a child of the earth mother, for goodness sake, I'm still a kid. I've just happened to have kids of my own now. So I even tell my kids, if you're confused, chat to your grandmother, she's in spirit, but chat to her anyway. Look, she'll help put things right. And yeah. whether that's whether that's us telling our, you know, whether we are talking to our loved ones in spirit or whether we're giving ourselves a counselling session and working things out, I don't care. I don't doing. care. Mm -hmm. I still do it because I do find peace in that. Yeah. And, and, I, and I get answers. Yeah. And you will find the answers within. Scott, yeah. I want to say thank you for being so open and being so transparent and being one of life's genuinely lovely, nice guys. We all have a Stop story. <laughs> no, but we do. We all have a story. Yeah, but you we are all have a one, story. We do. One of genuinely nice guys. And, you know, I I really am so blessed that you um, are now doing what you're doing with the publishing company, with your own books, with your wife. You've got, you know, your beautiful family. But you've found that peace. And thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. It means the world to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Scott, you're a darling. Thank you.